She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. And I know we are smack dab in the middle of our Florence Monster series, but when I encountered this case last week, I knew I had to make a video about it because the whole thing is quite bizarre. And I also know that there's some people who are watching me that don't necessarily like the multi-part series or they like to wait until they're all posted before they start watching, which I completely understand. So while we're doing the series, I'll throw a couple coffee and crime times in just to keep everybody happy and to make sure that everybody has enough content to enjoy. So let's talk about the case we're here to talk about today. On June 14th, 2014, the parents of 12-year-old Charlie Bob reported that he had walked out of his Detroit, Michigan home and never returned. Eleven days later, Charlie was found by the police in the basement of that very same home he had allegedly run away from. And although his father and stepmother insisted that they had no idea he'd been there the entire time, Charlie had a very different story to tell. We have a lot to talk about today, but before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a modern VPN designed with the user in mind. Surfshark encrypts all data sent via the internet, protecting your passwords, private messages, photos, videos, and other sensitive data from prying eyes. But did you know that it can do so much more than that. With Surfshark VPN, you can overcome location-based price discrimination on plane tickets and car rentals by connecting to VPN servers in different countries. And when you're traveling, you can use Surfshark to not get locked out of your bank account. And you can use it to continue reaching your favorite sites and services, even in countries that ban them because Surfshark gets around censorship and geo-blocking. With Surfshark VPN, you can also access different entertainment and media, including 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, and that means the U.S. and Japan for all you anime lovers. You can also watch BBC, iPlayer, Hulu, and other limited streaming services wherever you are by using VPN servers in the countries where they're available. So let's say you go to Canada and their Netflix offerings are completely different and they don't have the show that you've currently been binging at home in the United States. Well, you just use Surfshark VPN to sign into a server in the U.S. and you'll have all of your Netflix library there for you. Or if you want to watch a show that only plays in the UK, you can just use Surfshark VPN to make it look like you're in the UK so that you can watch their shows. You can unlock content on most platforms by installing Surfshark VPN on computers, phones, smart TVs, and more. And Surfshark has 3,200 plus servers in 100 countries. And they're the only VPN at this time to have coverage in 100 countries. So you will find a server anywhere you go. Surfshark can do so much, and they have apps for all platforms, from PC to Mac and Linux, Android, iOS, Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, Chrome, Firefox, Xbox, and PlayStation, and more. And if you have children who play on the Xbox or the PlayStation and they're um, playing live games with other people, it is really best to install Surfshark VPN on their devices so that nobody can figure out where they're connecting from. It just keeps them safe. One of the best parts is that this one subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices at the same time. So your children's video game consoles, your tablet, your computer, your phone, your partner's tablet, phone, computer, your mom's tablet, phone, computer, everybody you love 
can be protected with Surfshark VPN. And 24-7 live customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee means there's no reason you shouldn't try Surfshark out. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow to get up to three additional months for free. That's surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to protect your online privacy today and get an additional three months for free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. I highly suggest that everybody uses a VPN and Surfshark is the best one out there. So check them out. And now let's dive in. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little background and context into this case. First of all, we're going to have two people with basically the same name in this case, and it's going to get confusing. We've got Charlie Bothell, um, who is the child in this case, and then we have his father, Charles Bothell. So I believe that Charles Bothell, the older one, he's the fourth, and then Charlie Bothell is the fifth. So when I refer to the child in this case, I'll call him Charlie, and when I refer to his father, I will call him Charles. So a little background on Charlie, the child. He was living with both of his parents, but then they split up, and after his parents split up, Charlie began living with his mother, Africa Shippings. But when he failed the fifth grade, his father, Charles, decided it was time that Charlie live with himself and his wife, Monique Dillard Bothell. Now, Charles planned to homeschool his son and correct his academic issues before enrolling him in a public school again in the fall of 2014. But Charles and Monique had also let Charlie know that if he did not keep his grades up or work on his behavioral issues, they would be sending him away to a boarding school or even a military school. Now, according to Charles, by the summer of 2014, Charlie had been doing better with his schoolwork, but he had yet to fix the issues with his behavior. Now, Charles Bothell and his wife, Monique, lived in a condominium building, and their kids, Charlie, and then also his two step-siblings, resided in this condominium building with them, and they were the only children in the building. And some issues had popped up with the other residents who had pointed the finger at little Charlie as the culprit. Reportedly, Charlie was urinating in some of the residents' garbage cans. He'd started fires in some garbage cans. And Charles believed his son had also tried to set their apartment on fire twice. Charlie also butted heads with his stepmother, Monique, who would later tell the police that Charlie never followed the rules that she and her husband had laid out for him. He specifically did not want to listen to her when it came to enforcing the rules. He was sick of being homeschooled, and he desperately wanted to live with his mother again because she made him do zero work, and there were no consequences for his actions when Charlie was with his mother. It was Monique Dillard Bothell who was with Charlie on the day he went missing. Now, she claims that she woke up around 4.30 a.m. to nurse her nine-month-old daughter in bed before falling back asleep and then waking up again at 6.15 a.m. By this time, her husband, Charles Bothell, had already left for his job working as a nurse, but Monique noticed a light on in the hallway. So when she got up to go to the bathroom around the 6 a.m. time, she claimed she saw little Charlie in the hallway standing in front of a mirror and doing bicep curls, which were part of his daily workout routine. Now remember that, because it's going to be important. Remember that little Charlie had a daily workout routine. After finishing in the bathroom, Monique checked on her nine-month-old daughter, Lily, and her four-year-old son, Luke, to see if they were still sleeping peacefully, which they were. So she went downstairs to the kitchen while Charlie finished the weights portion of his workout regiment upstairs. After he finished with his weights, Charlie went downstairs to put some time in on his ab coaster, which, for those of you who don't know, it's like a little workout machine. Charlie finished on the ab coaster at around 7.30 a.m., at which time he went upstairs to take a shower. After this, Monique claimed the day went along as it normally would. Charlie emptied the dishwasher after his shower, he washed any dishes that had been in the sink from the night before, and then he went upstairs to do his schoolwork. At 11.30 a.m., Charlie asked Monique if he could make some peanut butter sandwiches for lunch, and then Monique did some work on her computer and watched orange is the new black on her laptop. Now listen to this portion of Monique's statement, which she gave to the Detroit Police Department on June 17, 2014. She said, quote, Charlie usually has an afternoon workout. However, I can't recall if he did it that day or if the afternoon workout was reserved for the weekdays only, end quote. Now I'm going to try to not add any of my own commentary yet. I'm going to continue on with the events of that day before I contribute anything extra, but it's coming. 
Monique continued with her day. She got her kids fed. She did some laundry while Charlie was upstairs working at his desk. And then at around 6.15 p.m., Charlie began what Monique called the elliptical part of his workout after completing the weights portion of his workout with Monique. So he did a workout in the morning. He's doing another one at night. He does the weights portion with Monique, and then he, he goes on the elliptical machine. So as Monique started preparing dinner, she could hear the whoosh, whoosh of the elliptical machine as Charlie used it. But suddenly, she heard the whooshing sounds stop around 7.23 p.m. She then saw Charlie remove a barrier of barbells and shoes that he had set up around the elliptical machine to keep his little sister Lily from getting too close while the machine was in motion. And Monique told the police that she knew Charlie wasn't done with his elliptical workout yet because he hadn't been on it long enough. And so when she saw him stop the machine, get off the machine, and then head upstairs, she snapped a picture of the elliptical screen with her cell phone and sent that picture to Charlie's father, Charles Bothell. Monique said she did this because Charlie was supposed to complete 4,000 revolutions on the elliptical, and he'd only done 3,008. As she was sending the picture, Monique heard the elliptical start whooshing again. And so she went over to where Charlie was working out on the elliptical machine, and she told him, quote, I thought you were done. Charlie told her, no, he hadn't been done. He had just needed a bathroom break. Monique waited until Charlie had finished all 4,000 elliptical revolutions, and then she confronted him about lying. Monique told Charlie that she didn't believe his bathroom break story for a second. He'd been trying to duck out of his elliptical workout early, and the only reason he'd gotten back on the machine and finished his 4,000 revolutions was because he'd heard Monique take the picture of the elliptical screen as he was walking upstairs, and little Charlie knew that she was going to send it to his father and he would be in trouble. Monique told Charlie that she knew he would never cut his workout short if his father was the one home, and she was upset that Charlie felt he could get away with it because he was home with her. Then Monique sighed and told Charlie to just go upstairs and take a shower, and she continued getting dinner for her other two children, and she changed diapers and then got her little ones ready for bed. So now I'll add some extra spice to this whole, in my opinion, bizarre statement. Now the date we're talking about is June 14th, 2014. Not only is it the summertime, but it's a Saturday. And from what I can tell, 12-year-old Charlie Bothell's life seemed to revolve around a daily routine of getting up super early to do this intensive workout and then doing homework, doing housework for Monique, you know, washing the dishes, loading the dishwasher. And this same daily routine appears to have persisted into the weekends and even into summer vacation. So you mean to tell me that this 12-year-old was getting up before the sun on a summer day in June on a weekend day and working out, but not just once during the day, twice, in the morning and in the evening. And from Monique's statement, that's what I gathered, right? That Charlie had a workout he was supposed to do in the morning and then one he had to do at night. And then maybe even another one that he had in the afternoon as well, because in her statement, Monique said that Charlie usually had an afternoon workout, but she wasn't sure if that was only on the weekdays. Now that means, if I'm understanding correctly, this kid is working out three times a day, Monday through Friday? I think that sometimes people who are abusive and controlling have been used to being that way for so long, and no one has ever put them in their place or questioned them about it, so they start to not see their behavior as being wrong, and they talk about it freely with others, not understanding how off and toxic and damaging it sounds to normal people who don't find abusive controlling tactics to be normal behavior that should be exerted upon a child. Monique talks about hearing little Charlie on the elliptical, but knowing that when he stopped working out on that machine, he had not completed all 4,000 revolutions that he knew he was supposed to. First of all, it should honestly be up to the individual doing the physical activity as to when he or she stops based on how they're feeling, not based on some arbitrary workout plan that's been set for you by grown-ass adults who have grown-ass adult bodies and don't understand what it's like to be a kid. You know, working out like this, it's all about listening to your body and knowing that some days you can do more and some days you have to do less. But the way, the way that Monique snapped a picture immediately and sent it to her husband Charles and then confronted Charlie and called him a liar because he was 1,000 elliptical revolutions short, in my opinion, this is abusive behavior. The kid had to use the bathroom. 
you know, he has the right to stop his workout and use the bathroom. And even if he didn't have to use the bathroom, and even if he did lie about that and he just wanted to stop the workout, who cares? He clearly felt he was done on the elliptical machine and maybe he was just tired or sore that day and his body was telling him to stop. Going further than that, Charlie took it upon himself to get back on the elliptical machine and finish his workout. But Monique still felt she needed to confront him and threaten him with his father's wrath. She couldn't just be happy and proud that Charlie had taken the initiative to just finish the workout, even if he did it only because he didn't want to get into trouble with his father. Isn't it enough that he realized there was the threat of trouble and got back on the elliptical? No, not for abusive parents, right? Not for abusive adults when it comes to children because abusive adults feel powerless in their own life for some reason and they look for the next smaller or weaker person to take their anger out on. So Monique had to let Charlie know, I don't care if you actually ended up doing the right thing. I don't care if you actually finished your workout I think you lied, and I'm going to confront you and threaten you about this now because I want you to know that if you don't do things exactly the way I tell you to, even if you get the thing done, but you don't do it exactly the way I tell you to, you're going to be in trouble because that's how these abusive parents exert their control, by keeping these kids in a constant state of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Now, Monique claims that at around 9.30 p.m., she went upstairs to see what was taking Charlie so long in the shower. And that's when she saw that the bathroom door was open and the lights in the bathroom and in Charlie's bedroom were off. So she couldn't find him in the bathroom. He wasn't in his bedroom. Monique looked in Lily and Luke's room, but Charlie wasn't in either of those rooms either. She then went downstairs and checked the guest bathroom, the kitchen, the hallway closet, and then she went to the basement of the apartment building to check the laundry room. Now, Monique said there was a two by four over the tunnel door, so she knew Charlie wasn't in there. And the tunnel she's referring to is a long corridor that joins all the units of this upmarket condo building and also has an exit that leads to the outside. So that door that leads to the outside in this basement tunnel, it's usually kept locked and only the maintenance team has keys. But it didn't appear to actually be locked or closed the week that Charlie went missing. And we're going to talk about that later on. So when Monique could not locate Charlie anywhere, she called her husband Charles Bothell. And he left work and headed home, calling Charlie's mother Africa on the way and asking her to meet him there. Africa lived only two miles away from Charles and Monique, so she arrived to the condo around the same time as Charles. And they all started looking for Charlie. Law enforcement arrived at around 11 p.m. and Monique gave a description of little Charlie, telling police that the last time she had seen him, he'd been dressed for bed, wearing gray pajama pants with green lines and a dark red t-shirt. Now, this part of her statement always bothered me because reportedly, according to her statement, the last time she would have seen Charlie was when he finished his workout on the elliptical machine and then he went upstairs to shower and get ready for bed. And then when she was like, what's taking Charlie so long in the shower? That's when she goes looking for him and can't find him. So why would he be in his pajamas and ready for bed when he was on the elliptical machine? Riddle me that, Batman. Why is Monique saying that he was dressed in his pajamas and ready for bed if he hadn't even showered yet? And it wasn't as if he'd woken up that morning and just stayed in his pajamas because we know, based on Monique's own statement that Charlie took a shower after his first workout. So does Charlie take two showers a day? Or is this statement maybe not so accurate? I also don't really think it's typical for somebody to be wearing flannel pajama pants and working on an elliptical machine. That would probably be hot. You know, the pants are going to be a little looser. It just doesn't seem like the proper attire for, you know, riding that elliptical. So the police also spoke to Charles and Africa, and Charles told them that his son had run away two years prior, at which time little Charlie had gone straight to his mother's house. Charles told the police to check into some people who might know where Charlie was, such as one of his neighbors, Neil, who apparently had some kind of issue with Charlie. I think it was the urinating in garbage cans situation that had pissed Neil off. Charles also told them to look into Africa's cousins, extended family, and teenagers from their neighborhood that Charlie may have had contact with. And Charles and Africa went out in their cars and on foot, searching the neighborhood and surrounding areas for Charlie until midnight, at which point they started printing out missing persons flyers and posting them and handing them out. 
Now, by the time Charles Bothell and Monique Dillard Bothell gave their official statements to police on June 17, 2014, it appeared there was already suspicion going around that they had been involved in some way in little Charlie's disappearance. The police asked Charles what he would do if he were to conduct the investigation. And Charles Bothell responded, quote, have myself and my wife do lie detector tests immediately so that we can silence some of the people who automatically think that the parents had something to do with it, end quote. He also said, quote, fully question my wife and I so that you can clear us quickly in your investigation and be able to announce to the press slash media that we are not suspects so that everyone's attention can be focused on pursuing efforts and or leads that will result in the safe return of my son, end quote. Now, Charles Bothell would end up taking a polygraph with the FBI, not the Detroit police, because according to Charles, the police were treating himself and his wife like suspects, and he didn't like that. So he took a polygraph with the FBI. Monique had refused to take a polygraph with the Detroit police, and according to Charles, the FBI never asked her to take one, and if they had, she would have. Sources say that the father and stepmother are being looked at as persons of interest, but they tell me they feel like they're being treated as suspects. Meanwhile, all they really want, they say, is their son to be found safely. Just worried to death. Day by day, the pain of not knowing the whereabouts of his son is just eating away at Charlie Bothell IV, he tells me. 12-year-old Charlie Bothell V was living here in this home in downtown Detroit with his dad, stepmom, half-brother and sister. This is his, um, his bed, his room, his, his towel. It's been 10 days that Charlie's bed has been empty. His stepmom, Monique, tells me each day is like a nightmare. When they marched a dog through here, with a bulletproof vest, and they let us know that it was a, cane, a cadaver dog. I nearly lost it. I, I just couldn't imagine that they would even. Since the boy's disappearance, Charlie the Fourth and Monique have been involved in search parties for the child. Sources tell 7 Action News Charlie the Fourth's polygraph test was inconclusive, but he tells me he and his family have been treated unfairly. People always suspect the parents and a stepmother, you know, come on. That's just one of those stereotypical things we do, you know, and we get that, you know, but the bottom line is the reason that we've there's not like, there's not another Detroit Police Department or FBI that I can go to. Well, I don't like this DPD or this FBI so I can go to somebody. No, this is who I've got and this is who can help me get my son back. Sources also say Monique refused to take a polygraph test, a claim she doesn't deny. She tells me her attorney advised her not to. I didn't, I didn't trust to be treated fairly. DPD, and absolutely. I, like my husband said, I understand we are the first. You're going to zero mm. in on us. Understandable. But we've been mm. more than open. We've been mm. more than helpful. Police were out searching a nearby building. Charlie the Fourth is hoping to raise awareness nationally, even appearing on Nancy Grace tonight on CNN. The couple says right now all the attention should be on one thing. Look, my son is missing, so find him. Now, the Detroit Police Department and the FBI searched Charles and Monique's apartment and the condominium building more than once. I believe they had searched three times. And after Charlie had been missing for over 10 days, the Detroit police announced that they had found evidence which had led them to believe that Charlie may have become the victim of a homicide. Now, from the very beginning, Charles Bothell had no problem sitting in front of reporters and giving his side of the story. And as you heard in that clip, he was planning to talk to Nancy Grace about Charlie's disappearance. This appearance on the Nancy Grace show was scheduled to happen on June 25th, and it was the clip from this interview that I saw floating around, which made me want to look into the case more because it's one of those stranger than fiction moments. Charles Bothell goes on Nancy Grace's show to raise awareness for little Charlie being missing, and as they're discussing Charlie, Nancy gets some unexpected news. Uh, with me is his father, Charlie Bothell. Charlie, we are getting reports that your son has been found in your basement. Sir? Mr. Bothell, are you... Are what? You... Yeah, we are getting reports that your son has been found alive in your basement. What? Yes, that's what... If, if you could hand me that wire very quickly. Yeah, we're getting that right now from, from, yeah, how, how could your son be alive in your basement? Uh, 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 oh, shit. Uh, 
I have no, I have no idea. I, I, Now, this is just a report that we are hearing out of Detroit that we're trying to confirm. Uh, okay, everybody please. in New York, please get on it. Uh, let me know when we get Charlie Langton from WWJ. Uh, sir, did you check your basement? I checked my basement. The FBI checked my basement. The Detroit police checked my basement. My wife checked my basement. Um, I've been down there several times. We've all been checking. I'll... Okay, uh, this, my... this is what we, what we are hearing, that uh, the missing 12-year-old boy has been found alive and well in his father's oh, yeah. basement. Now, this is what I, I don't understand why you guys would have reported he's missing, and all our viewers he's have been, been on the lookout that... for him. We've been, we've been on the lookout for him. We searched that entire house repeatedly. The FBI searched, the Detroit police searched, we've all searched. <sighs> oh, God, they brought dogs, everything, everybody is searched. What... Okay, my son. Have you checked your cell phone? Um, my cell phone is dead. Um, I, I'm, and I actually getting down here. I left it in the car charging because it, 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 it had, it had, it, um, it had died on me. Okay. And you're oh. telling us that you searched your basement and your wife searched your basement. I searched my basement. My wife searched my basement. The FBI searched my basement. The Detroit police searched my basement. Um, we've all searched my basement multiple times. Uh, I mean, we, yes, they had the dogs search, the, we, we've all searched the basement, the dogs searched my basement, oh God. Okay, well, you know what, I'm going to give you a chance to call home and see what you can find out. Charlie Langton, WWJ News, uh, Charlie, we're getting reports tonight that the boy has been found alive in daddy's basement. Yeah, Nancy, we just, we're just getting word right now, and we've just basically confirmed that, yeah, the boy has been found alive in the father's basement. And we're just getting reports right now that that is true. Uh, and, and literally, it, it just broke, moment, broke moments ago. Now, why the boy, why the father didn't know about that for the last 11 days, uh, what if the child was afraid, if there was any other collusion amongst anyone, what the child ate, all of those are questions that we are trying to get reports on right now. We understand that, that we're sending news crews right now to the scene. Uh, we're also understanding that the police chief is going to make yet another announcement that should be coming up a little bit later on. But, yes, the boy has been found alive in his father's basement. <laughs> Yeah, so that was crazy, right? I mean, imagine watching that go down in real time. And here was the general consensus to Charles Bothell's reaction to the news that his missing son had been found in his basement. <laughs> but yeah, that's completely fake. I think he's lying. It's definitely. Maybe that's how he reacts. I know myself, I would have gone up and up. Right. Like if your kid was missing for 12 days, wouldn't you be like going straight to the kid? That's right. You like... would still be sitting in the interview. Something's not right. I think there's something, uh, something more going on here. So this guy's son was missing for 12 days and it was in his basement the whole time? How do you not know that? I think it's all bullshit. Somebody's in your basement. What, you know? Do you believe that this guy is telling the truth? Because I surely don't believe him. Do you believe him? Nah, if that was me, I'd be running out the studio. <laughs> the interview, I'd be out of there. No, I don't believe him, but trust me. He knows what's going on. But really, though, this is what people thought. And honestly, it was what I thought, too. When Nancy Grace informed Charles Bothell that his son had been found in his basement, she didn't say right away that Charlie had been found alive. And Charles didn't ask. This stuck out to me as odd because I think it's the first thing I would have asked. Is he okay? Okay, you found him. He's been missing 10, 11 days. Is he okay? Is Charlie okay? It seems reasonable that this would be the first question most parents of a missing child would want the answer to immediately. So Charles Bothell, he leaves the Nancy Grace show. He speeds home immediately while Detroit Police Chief James Craig began a press conference outside of the Bothell condominium building. Now, Charlie had been found in a storage closet in the basement, and placed in front of that closet had been a makeshift barrier of boxes, along with a 55-gallon drum, which the police did not feel Charlie could have placed there himself. And he appeared to be hiding back there, or, or some, or you say he could not have erected this little hiding place by himself? In my judgment, based on what was described, I didn't see what it looked like prior to my arrival, but there's no way he could have erected this makeshift 
uh, area of concealment, I'll call it. He um, certainly was excited to see us. I had a chance to actually talk and embrace Charlie. Uh, very excited to see us. I mean, this is a great story. And this was, in fact, the fourth time we've been to this location. On, and one of our visits, uh, we came with a cadaver dog. So we're not certain that Charlie was here doing those visits, we're not certain at all. Because the question I would have, how could we miss? Uh, certainly we know when there's a missing, uh, we go into a family home, we check places that children can hide. Sometimes if children are afraid, they will hide and conceal themselves. But for whatever reason, uh, I don't know what it looked like the first several visits, but certainly this time, uh, the detective who was in that area thought something was strange and began to moving, and, and Charlie didn't alert his presence. It was Charlie only when was, you found him. It was only, and you could see that he was uh, nervous, but excited, and glad to see the police. Describe his condition. What was his condition? Like, uh, did he look like he was hungry or what? Well, he indicated he was hungry. Uh, certainly, I saw evidence that there was food around the area where he was hiding. Yeah, his parents aren't here right now, correct? That's we, correct. The father told us he was going to go and do an interview with Nancy Grace a little while ago. The mother, once we told her that you guys were looking into the possibility of a homicide, the stepmother, I should say, she uh, she took off. Do, do, is there any, uh, any reason to believe that some adult had to know Charlie was in that house? I will tell you, we're not ruling that out. It would be hard for me to sit here and tell you that someone didn't know that Charlie was there. And as James Craig was talking to the media, Charles Bothell pulled up. And I don't know what the plan was when he faced the reporters who crowded his car. But the way he acted was very strange. Charles was incredibly defensive right off the bat. And then he embraced a reporter and appeared to sob in this reporter's arms. It's not always good news, but certainly. Uh, Here's Dad. This is the father. Do uh, Dad. Did you know that he was in the basement? Man, no, I didn't know that he was in the basement. I searched. My wife searched. We've had dozens of police officers, FBI agents here, dogs. We've all been searching for my son. You know, so any intimation that I knew that he was in there somehow is absurd. Literally, I couldn't find him. You know, if the FBI couldn't find him and the Detroit police couldn't find him, well, for anybody to intimate, they did finally. Yeah, they've been living in my house for the last 10, 11 days. Have they've been here. We looked in my basement. I looked in my basement. They looked. They went down there with search dogs. My wife looked. When was the last time you looked? When was the last time you looked for your son down there? The last time I looked for my son down there was um, a few days ago before the FBI did, before so they came with the since. dogs. No, I've been in the basement, but um. Has he ever he hidden in the boxes and in the containers? Before? Has he ever hidden down there before? No, he hasn't. We heard that your ex-wife may have been hiding him down there from you and feeding that's, him. That's 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 absurd. And my ex-wife did not um take off. The FBI or the, the task force was here executing a search warrant. They forced my wife to leave. I was here. You guys were here. They stated we could not be in the house while the search was being executed. That was a decision of law enforcement, not the decision of my wife. Have you ever heard that he was found in the basement? I'm, 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 I'm shocked because I looked, like I said, the Detroit police looked, the FBI looked repeatedly. They've been through here. They've been in my house until 3 in the morning on occasions and all night. When, when, when that lieutenant kept me and my family at the police station from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., the Detroit police and the task force were here all night executing search warrants. So to say that, um, you know, for anybody to imply that I somehow knew that my son was in the basement, it's absurd and it's wrong. I love my son. I'm glad that he's home and he's going to have the great future that he deserves to have. Well, no one well, here yet. I talked to you earlier today. There was there was deeper concern, perhaps, about a homicide. Yeah, tell man, you broke my heart with no, no, that, no, man. Tell me about your range of emotions based on what the police were. Man, they thought my son was dead, man. That, have you seen your son yet? Shit. No, I haven't. <laughs> Do you, know, do you know where he is? Where's your wife? Where's no, your wife I don't. Right now? No, I don't. Where's my wife, wife, she left. They they wouldn't let her in the house. But I, I want to see my son. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You. It was implied that perhaps that your ex, your your current wife, might have been keeping him down there and hiding him perhaps from you. That is absurd. Does your ex-wife? That is absurd. Did say that she's told you point blank that she does not know where he is? Yes, she has. 
period. My wife wouldn't do that. Would you have noticed? If, would, you have, would you have noticed any disturbing of the property? I mean, you would have noticed he was coming in and out, wouldn't you? I, you know, I can think I would have, but I, I would think that I would have noticed that he had um, a Twitter account that I didn't know about, which the FBI told me, and some, you know, additional money that they found. So, I mean, as a parent, you do everything you can to keep as close a track on your children as you can. Did he have a key? Could he have gone in and out? We had extra keys around. I mean, so it's possible. We have extra keys. Are they? Are any of them missing at this point? Have you looked at that? I, I, that hasn't, that hasn't, that hadn't crossed my mind, period. I want my name cleared and my family name clear. And After Charlie was recovered and, I guess, saved by law enforcement, he told them he was hungry. So they brought him to McDonald's and then to the hospital to be examined and given medical treatment. At the hospital, doctors found marks on Charlie that may have indicated he was the victim of some kind of physical abuse. On his chest, they found a half-circular scar, and on his backside, there were some old, healed scars found. After being released from the hospital, Charlie was handed over into the care of his mother, Africa Shippings, and police began an investigation into exactly what had happened. On June 26th, police announced that they were investigating the possibility of child abuse due to blood found on Charlie's clothes in the Bothell home. And reporters saw detectives knocking on the door of Charles Bothell, but no one answered. I can't comment on anything. Why is that? Um, the council told me to um, just say no comment. Little Charlie's father, who had been so willing to talk to us before, now not saying much on the advice of his lawyer. It's all happening as police sources say they are investigating possible child abuse and that blood was found in the home where Charlie lived with his dad and his stepmom. And Charlie, Charlie and your son would never Charlie. hurt Charlie? Well, you will not hurt him, harm. You will discipline him. I saw that much I know. You will discipline you him. Discipline. You will discipline him but not hurt him. What about your wife? How is she doing? This is it's rough on all of us, but I'm glad my son is found. I, I do have to go. And you would never have abused him? Would you have ever hurt Charlie? No. You never hurt Charlie? No. About an hour before Charlie was found yesterday afternoon, his stepmom did not have much to say, but Action News has learned that her uncle, Godfrey Dillard, who is running for Michigan State Attorney General, has a listed address in the same building, just three condo units away from his niece, Charlie's stepmom. And police sources believe Monique Dillard Botho knew little Charlie was being kept a prisoner in the basement. And in the back of the basement, there is a hallway that actually connects all of the units. So was little Charlie able to to come and go on his own, or was some adult orchestrating his every move? Mr. Botha, we've given you a lot of attention and, and try, in hopes of finding your son. Please tell us that you did not, you and your you and your wife were not shuffling him back and forth. We were not. That's absurd. My son could not harm Charlie. My son is not that type of a person. He loved the boy. Did this you ever tell funny. police to search Godfrey's place? Sorry, guys. I know he disciplined him because Charlie don't want to do his homework sometimes. And uh, he don't want to do his homework. And he wants him to do good. He wants him to, be, to, to, to do good, to be somebody in life. So there's a lot we just heard in that clip that needs to be discussed. Clearly, at this point, there were only two scenarios that law enforcement believed could have happened. Either Charlie had run away and he was hiding in the basement, sneaking food from his apartment whenever he could, or someone in his family had been hiding him whenever the police came around to search, and that hiding place could have been in the condo of Monique's uncle, Godfrey Dillard, a lawyer who was running for attorney general of the state of Michigan, a man who lived just a few units down from the Bothells in that same condominium complex. Complex. We also heard from Charles Bothell's mother, who made it very clear to reporters that her son would never hurt Charlie. He was simply a strict disciplinarian who wanted to make sure his children grew up to be contributing members of society. We also would have later Charles Bothell's daughter, who was an adult at that point, come out and say, oh, my father's a good man. He's strict, but it's just because he cares. He's never laid a hand on me inappropriately. He's never been violent. He's never hurt me. But I think that what people don't always understand is abusive parents are not always going to dole out that abuse 
equally to all of their children. And there are times when fathers will feel that they can be a little bit more physically rough on their sons than their daughters. So just because one child says there's no abuse happening, it doesn't mean necessarily that there's no abuse happening. Also on June 26th, Monique Dillard Bothell was arrested and taken into custody for violating probation. The January prior to this, Monique had pleaded guilty to obtaining a pistol without a license, and part of her probation stipulated that she could not possess a firearm. However, police reportedly found a handgun in her home during the search for Charlie. They had known about it even before they found Charlie, but they didn't act on it when they were still looking for Charlie because their main priority was locating the child, and then they would handle, you know, extraneous issues like probation violations. Now, I think that they probably arrested her for this probation violation after Charlie was found to put some pressure on her to maybe see if they could make a deal with her to admit to abuse, to admit to hiding Charlie, and I'm not sure exactly what happened with that. I'm not sure what Monique told the police or if that's the reason they arrested her, but it does seem like a tactic that they would use. Now, at the time that Monique was arrested for this probation violation, her other two children were removed from the home and placed in protective custody. Detroit police also announced that they'd found the scar on Charlie's chest, the scar that was described as being a half circle. And they returned to the Bothell home and located a PVC pipe with blood on it. And the end of that PVC pipe was a match for the scar found on Charlie. On June 27th, Monique appeared in court for her probation violation, and she was released on a $5,000 personal bond with the requirement that she wear a tether. Also, on June 27th, it was announced publicly that Charlie had bruises and scars on him that had caused police to believe abuse had been happening in the home, and that Charlie himself had claimed his stepmother had been the one to put him in the basement, telling him not to make a noise no matter what he heard. Police found little Charlie two days ago, but sources say that on Monday, his dad admitted to physically disciplining little Charlie with a PVC pipe, and the FBI found blood on that pipe. And sources now telling us that next week, criminal charges could be brought against his dad and stepmom. Action News has learned that when Charlie was found hidden in the basement of the home where he lived with his dad and stepmom, he had old scars on his rear end from being hit with a PVC pipe. One bruise on little Charlie was reportedly a half circular scar on his chest from where Charlie said his dad drove that PVC pipe into him. Mr. Botha leaving a custody hearing today on his two youngest children, now not talking to the same reporters, he begged to help him find his 12 year old son, a boy who, according to one of his grandmothers, looked almost emaciated the last time she saw him before he was reported missing by his dad and stepmom. The grandmother telling investigators that, quote, he was very skinny and almost looked like a cancer patient. He had marks all over his arms and chest. And sources say that little Charlie said that it was his stepmother who put him in the basement, barricading him behind boxes and totes, then telling him not to come out no matter what he hears. And Charlie also telling investigators that his stepmom did not bring him any food, so he would sneak upstairs to get food when everyone left the home. And after a custody hearing today on their two youngest children, a four year old and an 11 month old, a referee decided that for now the Bothells can only have supervised visits with those two youngest children only. And Carolyn Child Protective Services, they have placed those two children with relatives. Reportedly, Charles Bothell and his wife Monique had felt that little Charlie was overweight, and so they put him on this strict exercise regimen, which required him to do 100 push-ups, 200 sit-ups, 100 jumping jacks, 25 arm curls on each side using 25-pound weights, and 4,000 revolutions on an elliptical machine each day. Charlie told police that he was required to do all of this within the space of one hour or he would be expected to start all over again until he could complete the workout in one hour. If he didn't complete the workout or if he took a break, he would be hit and then still expected to finish the workout. We haven't seen Charlie. I don't know if you've seen him, but, you know, we've been hearing that he was obese and now we're hearing that he was emaciated and starved. I mean, can you clear that up? Were they making him run on some kind of exercise equipment to lose weight? Well, that is what his attorney is saying. His attorney is saying, hey, look, 
uh, Mr. Botha was just doing the best for his son. He was having him run on an elliptical. He thought that was um, the best way to help Charlie lose weight. And apparently Charlie has lost a lot of weight. I know when I talked to Charlie's biological mother a few days ago, she said that yes, Charlie had been obese and that he lost weight and that he liked working out. She even said that Charlie likes looking good. And so she said her, that encouraged her son to keep working out. But there's that tipping point there. Where do we get from where Charlie likes working out to where it turns into being abusive or, or, or the allegations will, are just, are just mind-boggling mind -boggling at this point. So we'll just have to wait and see what pans out in this one. One of the Bothell's attorneys, Mike Magidson, talked to reporters defending Charles Bothell and claiming that he just loved his son too much. Anybody who has a 12-year-old boy, if that child doesn't have bru uh, uh, bruises or something on him, I'd find it be, to be uh, uh, remarkable. The problem that my client had is he loved this child too much. He cared for him. What parent takes the time to homeschool? He, he, he actually gave up. Uh, he, he wanted to start a business some time ago. He gave that up. He home, stayed home, took care of this kid, homeschooled him every day, and wanted the best for this son. Mr. Botho, who's a registered nurse, uh, put him on a diet of non-fried uh, foods and an exercise program on a, an elliptical. The allegations are that he was emaciated before he went missing. And what about the bloody clothes found inside the home? Magidson says simply, Charlie has eczema. He scratched, he put on t-shirts and it was bleeding. That's all that is. What about the allegations he was abused with a PVC pipe? That's false. We don't know anything about that. And finally, allegations his stepmother was hiding him in the basement. I read this petition. It says that Monique took him into the basement and hid him and told him not to come out. Why would she do that? I don't understand that. It makes no sense. How he got down there, why he was there, how long he'd been there, these are answers we don't have. On July 10th, state investigators released petitions detailing abuse allegations made by Charlie, and they were shocking. Charlie claimed he had been whipped by his father using sticks and pipes from 2012 to 2014, and that his stepmother, Monique, would sometimes punch him. She'd even choked him once and told him that she could make him disappear. Little Charlie said living with his dad and stepmom was so depressing, he even attempted suicide. Ever go anywhere with friends? No. Why not? I didn't have any. Why not? I never went outside unless I was allowed. Little Charlie Botho, now 13 years old and on the stand testifying about what he says was a terrible life with his father and stepmother who are charged with abusing and torturing him. Little Charlie said the first time his dad hit him with this PVC pipe was a few years ago after he ran away and police found him and brought him home. I was told to basically lay across the table, dining room table, and I basically he got spanked on the boat. With, with, with what? Uh, with anything? A wooden stick or a sharp file and then uh, a plastic PVC pipe. All at the same time? Yes. And this is the first time we are seeing photos of where little Charlie was found in his father's basement 11 days after his father reported him missing. Police say the basement was cluttered and full of boxes. Then one officer found little Charlie hiding behind this barrel. Charlie would later tell investigators that his stepmother, Monique Dillard Bothell, hid him in the basement and told him not to come out no matter what. Today, little Charlie said his stepmom has hit him, but it was rare. What did she do? Um, sometimes she would punch me or I, I got choked once. By her or someone else? Her. But the worst pain, he said, came from his father. If little Charlie failed to complete his chores, homework, or workout routine that sometimes lasted for two hours twice a day, he says his father would hit him with the pipe. Can you tell us where you had injuries? Um, on my butt. Well, how do you know it was injured? What uh, because the skin was split open. How do you know that? I could feel it, and I, and I saw it before. Okay. What, is, what would happen when the skin would be broken, if you can tell us? It would bleed. On February 20th, 2015, Charles Bothell and Monique Dillard Bothell were arrested and charged with child abuse and torture. They both entered not guilty pleas, and their attorney, Mark Magidson, criticized the way authorities had handled the case, saying, quote, The charges are ludicrous, overcharged. The fact that it took them this long to bring these charges shows 
that there's really a wanting of evidence, and it's probably more politically motivated than anything else. I am sure that knowing my clients, they're prepared to face these charges and be vindicated before a jury of their peers. End quote. In an email, Wayne County Prosecutor Spokesperson Maria Miller responded to Magnuson's comments, saying, quote, This case took a long time to charge because the assistant prosecutor had to review close to a couple thousand pages of paperwork before charges could be recommended. It was a long and arduous task. End quote. At this time, Charles and Monique were still in court regularly, trying to regain parental rights for their other two children. Now, little Charlie would testify that on the day he was reported missing, he had already showered and put his pajamas on for the night when he entered the kitchen where his stepmother was angry and accused him of lying about not finishing his workout, at which point she ordered him to go down to the basement. The arrest document stated, quote, Charlie reported Mrs. Dillard Bothell's voice was angry. Charlie felt as if he did not have a choice, so he did as he was told. Charlie followed Mrs. Dillard Bothell to the basement. She then led Charlie to the back of the basement and gestured to an area along the wall. The boy said that she told him, there, back there, go. End quote. Charlie then climbed over the 55-gallon drum placed in front of the storage closet, and Monique added boxes and other items in front of the drum before going back to her apartment upstairs. Charlie claimed that he could hear conversations happening in the apartment, and at that time he heard Monique call his father and tell him that Charlie was missing. She looked everywhere for him, but she believed he had run away again. Monique would periodically go down to the basement where she had concealed Charlie and tell him to shut up, stay quiet, and not to come out no matter what he heard. And sometimes Monique would bring Charlie a protein shake, but he was still hungry, and when he knew his family was out of the building and all was quiet in their apartment, he would sneak upstairs and get things like soda and cereal. Charlie even knew when law enforcement was there looking for him, but he didn't bring attention to his location because he'd been told to be quiet and he was scared of what his father and stepmother would do if he disobeyed their orders. In March of 2015, Charles Bothell and Monique Dillard sat in front of Judge Shannon Holmes for a preliminary hearing to decide if there was enough evidence to put them on trial for their charges. During the hearing, Dr. Dina Nazar, the chief of the child abuse team at Children's Hospital of Michigan, testified that although Charlie appeared pleasant, alert, and interactive with hospital staff, he did show physical signs of abuse, and he had told the doctors and nurses that his stepmother had threatened him with murder, saying she could kill him and no one would know because he was homeschooled. Dr. Nazar was cross-examined by Godfrey Dillard, one of the Bothell's lawyers and, of course, Monique's uncle, and Dillard pointed out that medical reports from doctors and nurses who had examined Charlie indicated that he had been well-nourished and hydrated, and he was only prescribed skin cream for a condition. He had uh, eczema, I believe. And then he was discharged from the hospital a day after being rescued from the basement. Sean Patrick Smith, another defense lawyer for the Bothells, he went on Nancy Grace to say that he didn't believe Charlie's story because the boy lived in a fantasy world. How can your client say that little Charlie has a very vivid imagination and lives in kind of a fantasy world when the cops found PVC pipe with blood on it in the home? Well, first, first, Nancy, when the, when the FBI interviewed little Charlie and they asked him what he wants to do when he grows up, he said he wants to make movies. He wants to be a movie producer. The uh -huh. kid lives in a fantasy world. The pipe was sent out to the Michigan State Police. It was analyzed for any blood evidence. There was no blood evidence on it. There's a little scar that's old on his chest and an old wound on his uh, buttocks that's really small. It could have happened anywhere, anytime. Now, that, that's interesting, uh, Mr. Smith, because the doctor that just testified in court said that 12-year-old Charlie had been abused physically and mentally, tortured, actually. Yeah, she, she, did, she did come there. She's been in the country for a year and a half. She's, been, she's a new doctor. She never actually interviewed Charlie. She never went to the scene to see the 500-foot basement that he was in. She never looked at the diagrams where he supposedly was being hidden for all this time. She didn't take into account the fact that If you could put Mr. Smith FBI, back up, please. Go ahead. Yeah. She, she didn't the take FBI into account what? that the FBI... They, Nancy, they searched the basement four times. Mm -hmm. The FBI is one of the best investigative agencies in the world. You as a prosecutor know how good they are. And to sit here and think... To, to have the, her come and think that, that he was sitting in the basement, hidden away from these people, while they were in the basement Please diagramming the entire put basement. him up. Go ahead. Actually, Mr. Smith, that's not what I think. I think that when the boy heard people coming, he was living in such a state of fear that he would run down that hall. Uh, for those of you that may recall, this is a series of townhouses, and all the basements are connected by an interconnecting hallway. That run, there it is. That runs the length of all yeah. the townhouses. This same lawyer cross-examined Charlie during the hearing and grilled the boy to prove that he was lying and that his statements were inconsistent. 
The defense team claimed that no one had told Charlie to stay in the basement. He had chosen to hide out in the basement, and he was free to come and go as he pleased. In fact, witnesses had seen him outside playing basketball during the 11 days he was supposedly missing. The court was informed by the defense team that there were no locks on any doors in the basement. Charlie was free to use the bathroom in the basement hallway, and he was able to come and go from his hiding spot in the basement as he pleased, evidenced by the fact that he had been sneaking into the apartment to get food. Now, like I mentioned briefly, Briefly earlier, the basement included a large hallway or corridor that connected all the condos, as well as an exit door to the outside. This outside door was usually kept locked with only maintenance employees having the keys to unlock it, but the week that Charlie was missing, that door had been left open so that residents could get rid of a buildup of trash in a dumpster left outside. According to the defense team, this means that Charlie could have left the property during the day, only returning at night, which would explain why FBI agents and police dogs had not found any sign of him during their searches. Charlie was also questioned about his past academic and behavioral issues at school, which had been the reason his father had wanted him to live with him to begin with. And while Charlie did admit to running away in February of 2012 and lying to the police about it, he denied his father's allegations that he had started a house fire in the condo the following year. Charlie also admitted that he liked working out, that he had been overweight, and both of his parents, including his biological mother, had wanted him to lose weight. He liked the physical results he was seeing from his workout regimen. Now, we're dealing with some contradicting information here. Did Charlie go outside and play basketball? Was he able to come and go as he pleased? If he did go outside and play basketball, it would make no sense that he said he was afraid to leave his hiding spot because his stepmother Monique had told him not to make a sound or come out no matter what he heard. If Charlie was leaving his hiding spot in the basement and going outside and kind of wandering about during the day and coming back at night, it would appear he was hiding from his father and stepmother, which doesn't discount that there was abuse happening. It only enforces it, in my opinion. However, when the lead investigator on the case testified, he talked about something he discovered during the investigation that made it look as if Charlie had not actually left the basement to go outside. And it also seemed as if Charlie's father and stepmother didn't really want him around at all. Actually, it seemed like they didn't really like him at all. Five days after Charlie Botha IV and his wife Monique reported his 12-year-old son missing, Detroit Police Sergeant Paul Pesmark became the officer in charge of the case. He's the last witness for the prosecution in this long preliminary exam to see if there's enough evidence to order the Bothos to stand trial on charges of abuse and torture. The defense contends 12-year-old Charlie had not been ordered by his stepmom to hide in the basement. They suggest that young Charlie alone was choosing to hide from police and his family. Sergeant Pesmark says there was a surveillance camera in the common hallway outside the basement. What did you view on that surveillance video? I observed uh, the missing Charlie Bothell V uh, prior to the day he went missing, taking garbage out, um, and then from the time that he went missing to the time that I arrived, I did not observe him go through the basement door. Today, prosecutors admitted into evidence an explosive text from Mr. Bothell to his wife just about an hour or so before Mrs. Bothell said Charlie ran away. They were texting about what they considered were excuses Charlie was coming up with to avoid his 4,000 revolutions on the elliptical. Mr. Bothell wrote, Wow, we need to get this money and ship his expletive. I am going to gear him towards completing one of these expletive law schools that I am about to attend. He lacks the discipline and core character and drive to be a doctor, nurse, scientist, period. Maybe time and continued effort may help, but I have no reason to be hopeful at this point. Let's get this money and get him gone. After hearing evidence and testimony from both sides, the judge decided that the Bothells would stand trial, but for child abuse and not torture. With respect to, I want to start with the testimony of Dr. Nazar, and I did allow the people to amend their complaint. The doctor testified on direct examination as well as cross-examination that she made her determination that the child had been tortured, and she used the word tortured, even though it's not a legal term. She said that it was based on her review of the medical history of the child, which has been determined by this court to be incomplete. She said she made her determination based on the medical records of the child, 
which has been determined by this court that those records were incomplete. She also indicated that she made her determination based on interviews, and the interviews were kids talk, FBI, different interviews, and just on some of the cross-examination of Charlie himself, this court finds that those interviews were inconsistent. The doctor also testified that she made her recommendation based on photos of the child. The doctor indicated that in order to determine whether or not a child is abused or tortured, as she indicated, she looked at the fact that Charlie had been isolated. She specifically stated that Charlie had no friends, no girlfriend, and that he was homeschooled. However, the testimony on the record by Charlie himself indicates the total opposite. Charlie testified that he did spend weekends with his mother, that he did have the opportunity to hang out with his cousins, that he did go to the park on occasions, that he did leave the state and spend time with his grandfather in another state. He testified in one of his interviews that he had, any time he went away from uh, the house on Nicolette, that it was never unmonitored by the defendants. Well, Charlie's testimony on the stand contradicted that interview because he did go to his mother and to his cousins and to other places, and he was not always accompanied by the defendants. During the examination, the doctor said she made her decision based on the fact that uh, he was isolated from what children do. However, it was clearly brought out on the record, as far as this court is concerned, that Charlie had access to social media. Now, he denied ever using it, and then he said, well, he did, but the specific posts that were he was cross-examined on, he said he did not post those things, but he never denied having the social media accounts, which goes against the uh, conclusion of the doctor that Charlie was isolated. The doctor also indicated that Charlie was homeschooled, which happened to be a part of why she ruled that or she thought that he had been isolated. And it's clear from the record, from Charlie himself, that he was homeschooled. He was having problems in school. He was not making the grade. He was having behavioral issues. And so the decision was made to homeschool. And unless the people are going to find that the state somehow failed, who's responsible for monitoring homeschool, and I didn't see the state, anybody from the state, indicated as a defendant in this matter, I certainly can't conclude that the fact that the child was homeschooled is a part of isolation for some uh, cruel or some kind of cruel intention to torture this child. The doctor went on to state that she made her ruling or her determination based on the fact that Charlie had been deprived of water and food. However, during his testimony, Charlie indicated at first he said that Monique, defendant Monique Bothell, brought him food in the basement. He later testified that he would actually sneak upstairs and get food. And then in his FBI interview, he said that Monique Bothell never brought him any food. He totally did not tell the truth. It's more than just a child being confused and being afraid. They're, they are totally inconsistent stories. What was even more glaring with respect to the testimony about the deprivation of food and water is that on June 25, 2014, and I'm on page 16 of 79 of the doctor's report, where the hospital said at the time of admission, and I quote, well nourished. No one made a finding that this child had been deprived of any water or any food. It says it. Nobody brought it out. But I told you all I read all of the records, all of the hundreds of pieces of paper that you all decided to admit into testimony. And glaring in the records, page 16 of 79, it says, child well nourished. The doctor also indicated that she made her recommendation based on the fact that Charlie had been deprived of some of the basic needs, such as using the bathroom, and he was made to hold his bowels. At the hospital, Charlie stated on more than one occasion that he had not had a bowel movement for 10 days. While this may not be important to anyone else, it was important to this court because Mr. Bothell, Charlie Bothell, the, the uh, complaining witness, got on this stand and testified that he would sneak upstairs and use the bathroom. Again, this is more than just a child forgetting something, being nervous, totally inconsistent stories, and just, he, I could not believe what he said. The doctor also testified that she made her recommendation of torture because of the excessive exercise and weight loss. 
However, on cross-examination, Dr. Nazar, who never had a conversation with Charlie, who never examined Charlie, who did not have the complete medical history, did not have the complete medical records, knew about the inconsistent statements in his interviews, assuming that she did. I could never really get clear on whether or not she reviewed all of the interviews, but she never talked to Charlie. And on cross-examination, she indicated that it could have been that he did not have enough food or it could have been that it was too much exercise that could account for the 25-pound weight loss that the child has sustained over a two-year period. Now, I bring that point up because when the doctor says, well, it could have been the lack of food, again, the hospital who examined the child at the time that he was brought in, the records say, well, nourish. In addition, Dr. Nazar on cross-examination admitted that she never reviewed the records of Dr. Mosby, who had examined this child with respect to his weight issues and had developed a plan for Charlie with respect to his weight loss. Those things are important if you're going to make a determination that a child has been tortured and that part of your decision is based on the lack of food or excessive exercise. So now it takes us to the basement. In order for me to find that the defendants tortured this child, I must found that, find that there was a forcible restriction of his movements or forcible confinement of his where he could not move about or they were interfering with his ability to move about. The court cannot find that. And here's why. First of all, I heard officer after officer get on this stand and testify that they searched the house. There was a missing child that had been reported and they searched the house. Not only did they search the house, specifically they searched the basement. Not only did they specifically search the basement, but they did it on more than one occasion. There were officers that testified that there were dogs that were brought out to this scene. Dogs who never detected Charlie. Now, it's, it's very important to understand that the cadaver dog did pick up a, sense of, a scent of Charlie in the back of the car that was driven by Mr. Uh, Mr. Bothell and in a dumpster, and I believe there was another hit. However, there was some testimony given that the cadaver dog wouldn't pick up his scent if he was alive. It's for decomposition of the body. But Charlie is still alive. He really did show up and testify here at the preliminary examination. And so in order for the court to find that this child was forcibly confined to a basement, not given food, but then given food, that he was forcibly confined to a basement, that he heard his father looking for him, saw his father looking for him, he testified that his father didn't put him in the basement, yet he never yelled out, yet he never stood up, yet he never made himself known. I just don't believe him. I don't believe that he was in that basement. And as a part of the preliminary examination, I am required to assess credibility. It doesn't get to the finder of fact if I find the witness to be wholly incredible, which is what I found this witness to be with respect to his confinement in that basement. I don't believe that he was there 10 days. I don't believe that they restricted his movement. I don't believe that the police were there and they did this thorough investigation. The FBI, the evidence recovery team, the trace team, the dogs, and nobody found little Charlie in the basement of his home. I just cannot believe it. And so based on those reasons, I am finding that the people have not met their burden with respect to count one. I am dismissing count one as to torture. With respect to count two, child abuse in the second degree. You're right, Mr. Smith. I must find that they used reasonable force. The testimony on this record was that this child was punched and that he was choked, that he was beat with a, he was disciplined with a PVC plastic pipe. Also, the pictures were consistent with his testimony where he said his father took that pipe, put it in his chest, turned it, and broke the skin. I reviewed a photograph that was consistent. The doctor testified that that scar was consistent with the use of that PVC pipe. Also on his buttocks, I reviewed that picture as well where the child testified that he was in fact hit with that PVC pipe on his rear end and I looked at the photos and it appeared that that testimony was consistent with what was shown 
in the photos, and that is not reasonable force. It is not reasonable to discipline a child in that manner. And so I am going to find that the people have met their burden with respect to count to child abuse in the second degree as to both of the defendants. So yeah, the judge clearly wasn't buying most of Charlie's story about how he ended up in the basement, and she was very transparent about that. She dismissed the torture charge but allowed the second-degree child abuse charge to stand. Before the trial for the abuse charges started, Charles Bothell was offered a plea deal, but he refused to take it, continuing to insist that he had not abused his son. The entire story that was blown up all over the world about me supposedly, you know, beating my son bloody and then having this plastic stick, you know, this bloody plastic stick that they paraded in front of the media, it was a lie. There's no bloody plastic stick pipe. Wasn't guilty of the torture, not guilty of child abuse. Again, I'm 46 years old, father of four, grandfather to two. I'm a registered nurse. I've taken care of hundreds, if not thousands of patients. I've been serving vulnerable populations my entire life. Never had a single accusation against me, ever. And Bothell says he's innocent, is not fully prepared to go to court, even though a guilty verdict could mean 10 years in prison. In January of 2016, Charles Bothell's defense attorney, Ferris Haddad, confirmed that his client had rejected a misdemeanor plea involving no jail time. Monique Dillard Bothell, however, did accept a plea deal involving no jail time, and this deal included her record being wiped out after six months if she stayed out of trouble. At this time, Monique and Charles were still legally married but had separated. But just two weeks after Charles Bothell told reporters and anyone who would listen that he was going to take this all the way to the trial, he accepted a plea deal, pleading guilty to a fourth-degree misdemeanor of child abuse. Charles Bothell was sentenced to 18 months of probation, and he was ordered to take anger management classes. As a result of this plea, Charles was not allowed to have any contact with his son, little Charlie. And in court, when Charles accepted this plea deal, he verbally confirmed at least some of his son's accusations. All along, Charlie Bothell IV swore he did not beat his son. Charlie V's reasoning, he said, for hiding from his father. Well, today, what happened became clear. He disciplined him and he hit it with him. Yeah. All right. Yes. I, I, I was Let's thinking. hear Mr. Bothell say. Right. Did you hit your son Charlie the, the fifth with the PVC pipe? Yes. In February of 2016, Charles Bothell sued Nancy Grace, claiming that she had made statements on her show that were knowingly false. In the lawsuit, these statements were listed. Nancy had said that there were markings all over Charlie's body that corresponded to a particular PVC pipe, which Charles had used to beat his son. She also said that little Charlie was found in the basement, shivering and hungry, that Charlie would be beaten if he didn't complete his workouts, that Charles was a garden variety sadist, that Charles forced Charlie to complete a workout routine that was torturous, that no person besides a top athlete in the world could have completed, that Charlie's bloody clothes were found in Charles's apartment, that Charles Charlie had not been given any food, that Charlie had to forage for food when he thought his father and stepmother were gone, that Charlie was systematically tortured by his father, and that Charlie was found in a tiny sealed-off room. And the lawsuit claimed that Nancy had used a fabricated graphic of this room that didn't exist. Charles claimed that he had lost his job as a nurse due to Nancy's fabrications, and even after the torture charges were dismissed, Nancy Grace refused to retract her defamatory statements. So that's pretty much where everything ended. And I guess the question would be, what exactly happened here? And we don't know for sure. We still have two completely different sides of the story. But if you ask me, I don't believe that Charlie, little Charlie, felt he had to stay in the basement. I don't know if Monique brought him down to the basement. I don't really know what happened here at all. What I do know, though, is if this workout regimen was actually happening and if Charles was using a PVC pipe to grind into his son's chest, if Charles was physically abusing his son because he wasn't completing these workouts, that's 100 percent abuse. And even if Charles Bothell can't see that, even if Charles just thought he was being, you know, strict and keeping his son on the straight and narrow and helping him get into shape and, you know, get his behavioral and academic issues under wraps, it still is legally and technically abuse, which is why he ended up taking that plea, if you ask me. But this story was crazy to me to just see Charles Bothell be informed by Nancy Grace on live TV that his son was found in his basement 
I will say that his reaction did not seem very sincere. I will say that he didn't seem surprised. I will say that it seemed like he was doing his best to act as if he was stunned and didn't know that Charlie was in the basement. So what does that mean? It could possibly mean that Monique and Charles wanted to punish Charlie and they wanted to basically keep him under wraps, possibly keep him in the condo, not let him go outside and play, not let him see his mother as some sort of punishment. And so they did keep him in the apartment and they were abusing him and they may have been withholding food, saying it was because he was overweight And they told the police that he was missing. And then whenever the police came looking, they stuck him in a different condo unit. And that's why the police and the police dogs and the FBI never found Charlie when they looked. Is it possible that Charlie himself went in the basement and just hid out there so that he didn't have to be the target of their abuse any further? That's also possible. But once again, this does not mean that there wasn't abuse happening. If this kid felt like he would rather sleep on a basement floor at night, then be in his bed in his condo with his brother and sister and stepmother and father, that says a lot. But what do you think about this case? What is your take on this? What do you believe happened here? Let me know in the comment section. I'm very much looking forward to getting your take on all of this. But I will ask that you like this video if you liked it, share it if you think it's worth sharing, and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye.